podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit event number 10, recorded uh, May 21st, 2021. Andy Weir, Project Hail Mary. It's time for triangulation. Well, kind of. It's a Twit event feed, but we're putting on a triangulation. We've brought the old... The old uh, lady back, uh, because I, there's no way in the world I'm not going to interview this guy uh, when he's got a new book. Uh, we've we interviewed Andy Weir when The Martian uh, came out. Uh, we uh, before the movie even. Uh, we interviewed Andy Weir when Artemis came out. He's got a new book, and it is a corker. Project Hail Mary, Andy Weir. Welcome back to Twit. It's so great to see you. It's great to be here. Boy, this really is an era of reboots, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> even Doctor Who, my friend. So Even Doctor Who. Even Doctor well, just Who. behind me there, you'll see a TARDIS. Oh, look at that. Is that yeah. a 3D printed TARDIS or is that the real no, thing? No, it's a toy. It's it's the, it's the real thing. It's actually it, the TARDIS. It does no. look uh, bigger it's, on the inside, I would imagine. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's, it's a toy. A toy I mean, TARDIS. I, I just bought it. It's not like I didn't make it. And a picture Although, of the red actually, planet above it. Although, actually, I do it. have a... Yes, I do have a Doctor Who chess set that I was sent by the UK publisher. That oh, was that's cool. cool. Are uh, yeah. the pawns all Daleks? They are actually yeah. the the there. There's two sides, white and blue. The white pawns are all Daleks, and the blue pawns are all canines. Nice. Everybody on everybody on the blue side are good guys, and everybody on the white side are bad guys. <laughs> I figured that part out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but not just that, but like all the pieces, like are. Like the blue rooks are sonic screwdrivers. Oh, and, how cool! Yeah, that's fun. So, I uh, a little we're going to tell you some ground rules right now, because the only reason Andy would even deign to talk to me is because <laughs> he has a book to sell, and uh, and we want to sell a lot of copies. So obviously, while many of you have already read the book and are dying to ask questions about the book, one hopes most of you haven't. There's a couple of options here. We could just stop, wait, and you could read the book. In fact. That'd be let's, my, let's, let's just give him a minute. That might be my suggestion. And by the way, if you haven't read The Martian and Artemis yet, you might as well get all three. Yeah. Uh, we'll see you in a couple of days. Yeah. I think what we're going to do is we're going to do the first half spoiler free. Because this, of all the books you've written, I, w I was looking back at the interviews we've done before, and we talked a lot about the, the contents of the book because it didn't really hurt it. But of all the books you've written... Uh, this one, you really want to go into cold. In fact, I would suggest don't read the thumbnail description. Don't read the back of the book. Don't read anything. Don't even Lock read... yourself in a cave. Put your, don't, don't even read the pl the log roll plug quotes. Nothing. Uh, this is such a great book to start from zero and, and follow along with the character. The only thing I'm going to say is the name of the character. I think I could say that. Sure. You had Mark Watney in the first book, Jazz Bashira, Bashara in the second book, a, fe mm -hmm. a woman, a great character. This Indeed, book, a, a female woman. The, and the only reason I want to mention this is because his name is Ryland Grace. It's Project Hail Mary, and for some reason throughout the entire book, you never said Hail Mary full of grace. I don't understand it. That, it's just a, a fun... <laughs> I, needed to, I knew I was going to name the ship the Hail Mary... And I'm like, okay, what's the name of the main character? And I'm like, Grace. <laughs> <Obvious>. <laughs> I'm keeping it. <laughs> all right, that's all. Snickers, that's Snickers. all. You, should, you shouldn't even use the S word there. Nothing. No spoilers. <laughs> I don't want anybody to know what it's about. It's not the Martian. It's not on the moon. It's not on Mars. It's not the. It's not any of that. It is good, of course, because Andy's. This is what he does. Hard sci-fi, with lots of problem solving. Uh, it's so much fun. It is, I think it's arguably, it's certainly as good as The Martian might be better than The Martian. It's just well, thank you. fantastic. Always trying to improve. Man. Now, so here what we're going to do. We're going to, first half of the show, we're not going to, we're going to be very, I'm going to be extremely cautious so that you don't hear any details. Well, you the should. first couple of chapters of no. stuff, I think it's fine to talk no. about. You no, want to okay. start the your book show. Your the show. same <laughs> way as your protagonist starts the book. With zero knowledge. 
That's a, in a way that's a spoiler too. Yes, you must start. You must start the book in the same way the protagonist starts the book, recovering from a coma. Uh, so you need to arrange to nothing. be in a coma. but yes. that's your problem. This is yeah. good. I hope you're in a coma now because then you won't have heard anything about this amazing book. <laughs> Second half, I, I'm gonna. We'll put up a big sign. We'll put some lower thirds up or something that says spoilers. Yeah. And 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 I and I'm, I cannot emphasize this enough. Don't. Listen to that part till you've read it. it. I'm not a big spoiler alert guy. I don't. I think it's kind of silly. <laughs> not in this case. Um, the the there is a journey of discovery in this book that is gold. Oh, thank you. And it's the, and you're following the journey of the uh, of the of the hero, and it's gold, and it's just wonderful. So, some preliminary questions before we get into this: Are you abandoning the Artemis moon base? Is it going to just stay up there all by itself? <laughs> well, I would like to. I, I have ideas for uh, additional books in Artemis. I mean, Good. my my. My my hope when I wrote it was that hey maybe this could become like a setting that I have lots of stories that take place in. Yes, I, I had it in mind that each each I'd write more books and each book would have a different central character. And so you know the first one is about jazz. The second one was I, I was imagining like a good good sci-fi murder mystery with uh, Rudy the Mountie who's kind of the law and Artemis being the main character. And you know I had all these grand plans, but then I mean. Certainly, Artemis sold well in the grand scheme of things, but it didn't, you know, it didn't knock my publisher's socks off. So they didn't really want a sequel right away. Oh, I hate publishers. Well, they, you know, I, I like them. <laughs> <laughs> Random House, we love you. Yeah. You're a wonderful, wonderful company. Well, they really are. I mean, they do so much publicity and marketing and yeah. stuff for me. They they go out of their way. I mean, I, I get, I get. I mean, I'm spoiled rotten. I get so much special treatment from them because they're like, it's one of those things like publishers and it also Audible, um, they decide, oh, this author is, he, he sells well. So we're going to advertise and market right. the crap out of his book. And a, then of course, then the book sells well. Right. And they're like, hey, see, we Surprise. were right. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Shock. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this one they should because this is amazing. And by the way, oh, thanks. I uh, when we talked about The Martian, I knew that you you actually commissioned the audiobook uh, early on on your own, which is Well, I didn't commission it. I I mean, you got it uh, made. I I got, I got a deal. I mean, yeah. I, they yeah. Whatever it is. You you signed for that before you had a book publisher. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Audible got the exclusive on this again. Yeah, well, they have a lot of money, and I like that. <laughs> I like money. And no they say, RC hey, Bray, though, uh, was that your yeah. choice or their choice? Oh no, not at all. It was their choice. I love, I, I love Bob. Um, Bob and Audible don't always see eye to eye on things. So. I was wondering. I figured there was some story. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you'd have to, I'll tell you what. You he was, here's what I said in my head. He was so good in The Martian. He was Mark Watney that he was. you don't want him to be Ryland Grace. Oh, no. <laughs> but I got to say, Ray Porter, who reads the Audible Ray, book. Ray Porter is a fantastic narrator, so I've got absolutely no complaints whatsoever. He gets that. He gets <laughs> but, your style. But, but just to be clear, I love Bob. Yeah, like, I do too. Bob's the man. So, And, and before I listened, I thought, oh, that would be nice if R.C. Bray read this. But I think Ray Porter uh, is clearly understands the personality and really inhabits it. And also, again, no spoilers, but the audiobook is unique. It's not like the print book in, in one kind of critical respect. Yes, there is an aspect of the story. Yeah, it's really hard to talk about. Don't say non anything. No, just... Okay, but there is, there is something... We'll save that for the second half. <laughs> I, I, I will say in a non-spoilerific way, there's an aspect of the story where sound matters a lot. Yeah. And so the audiobook, people are like, oh, yeah, we can go to town on this. Yeah, I'm glad they did. <laughs> It yeah, was me really too. well done. They did a great, and they put a lot of thought into that. I mean, they they went back and forth. They were sending me audio samples. Hey, what do you think of this? How about yeah. this? How about yeah. this? Getting my feedback and my agent's feedback and stuff. It was cool. That's really, really cool. And it you've uh, optioned or sold this book? Sold uh, the films, the film rights to MGM. Uh, Soon to be an again. Amazon company, I hear. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Ryan Gosling attached to play the oh, lead. Oh, that's God, so great. Yeah, it's great. And he has the same initials as the main character, RG. Ryan Grace. So he could maybe bring his cufflinks to set, whatever. <laughs> and then um, uh, we have uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller set to direct. 
And uh, yeah, so we have Chris the, Miller. The wow. Busters. This yeah. is very, very and exciting. Phil Lord. <laughs> and let's not Phil, Phil, Phil too, whoever he is. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> Lord and Miller, they're a directing duo. They've never Lord and Miller, they go together. They're together. They're a team. Yeah, oh my God, yeah. I, yeah. You know, you get me in trouble. <laughs> they did um, the Lego Movie, and I think uh, this is this is going to be another Lego Movie. Uh, well, it's going to be live action. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. No, actually, Lego and, Movie was a great movie, but this is, it was. It this was should and be uh, Into action. the Spider Verse also. Right, which was amazing. Yep. yep. Yeah, they're, they're fantastic directors. They really are. Yeah. Have Absolutely. they done any live action? <laughs> yes, they did all the 21 Jump Street movies. Oh, they prefer not to mention those, I think, but okay. Oh, those are fine. They're good movies. <laughs> and then also they did um, Solo until Disney got rid of them and decided, instead of making a good movie, we'll get rid of Lord and Miller and then make one that sucks. <laughs> So I, can't, I if they'd kept Lord and Miller, yeah, I bet you Solo would have been a good movie. <laughs> is, the, is the script is the script done? No, uh, we have the illustrious and talented Drew Goddard working on the screenplay. Uh, he's the same guy who adapted The Martian. So did a brilliant job. Awesome, he did. He's yeah. fantastic. And as I remember, he uh, he kind of uh, did it on his own, but uh, it was a beautiful, I thought, uh, and perfectly. Uh, true to the book. Uh, he did script. a fantastic job yeah. and he was my first pick. I'm like, yeah. we got to get Drew if we can. And this time I actually do have a modicum of authority because I'm a producer on the film. Oh, so, yay. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm trying to sit back and you let were the... You so cute. I re-listened to the first interview where, where you, it had been, uh, I think it had been optioned or purchased, but you didn't know anything about who who was going to do it or anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and you said, well, I, they're not going to let me, I don't think they're going to let me on the set and, and stuff like that. And it was so cute. Now you're on the set, man. You're a producer. Oh, yeah. I'm a producer now, man. Hell yeah. Well, it's funny because everybody wanted the book. Uh, you know, everyone wanted the rights. So I'm like, okay, well, let, let, let's see if I can flex a little. I said, I want gross participation. I want a cut of the, you know, of the actual ticket sales. Smart. And I, I don't want a. T I just want a teeny little no. taste. You know, just yeah, take taste. what you would Give me like. A taste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take what you would like to pay me for this, and then what percentage of the you know ticket you know sales do you think that'll be? And that's the percentage I want. I'm not. I, I just want to break into the gross participation world. They're going to do well and, by you because uh, The Martian was Ridley Scott's highest grossing movie. Yeah, no, that uh, went well. Which is okay, <laughs> and okay. it was nominated for an Oscar. Uh, I think they're going to do right by you. Oh, they did. Uh, yeah. And and so what happened was, like, I, I told my film agent, okay, well, tell everybody who's thinking about making an offer, tell them I want gross participation. And if everybody says no, then I'll, then we'll, we'll see what happens. And most of the studios said, oh, we don't, we don't do gross participation for authors, you know? Yeah. And MGM said like, yeah, we don't do gross participation for authors, but we do for producers. So we'll make you a producer. Yes. How's that sound? I think they kind of like, have to do that. Yeah. That's the kind of lateral thinking. I appreciate. <laughs> Problem solving. It's all about it. Yeah. But really I'm, I'm a producer for the purposes of profit sharing. Yeah. So I, I, I do have some authority here and there, but I'm trying to stay out of the way of the actual real producers who know what they're doing and just kind of let them do their jobs. I can, uh, you, of course, everybody here has read it already. Uh, and oh, great. we're all talking about, it. we can't wait to see it. Uh, actually, it makes sense that Lord and Miller uh, are doing it because uh, they've worked with Ryan Reynolds uh, before, right? Uh, Ryan Gosling. Gosling. I Re made that Reynolds mistake is too. Different guy. They work right. with I made that mistake. Yeah, it, it's a Canadian Ryan. It's hard to keep Ryan track of. Ryan Gosling but is the cute one. <laughs> I think they're both adorable. <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 yeah. But, um, you know, it's funny is I made that mistake. I, I, I said Ryan Gosling. I Sorry, I said Ryan Reynolds instead of Ryan Gosling while I was on the phone with Ryan Gosling. Oh, how embarrassing. But you know what? <laughs> I bet he gets so it was like I was talking to him, and, and he he's excited. Ryan is because uh, for the last several movies he's been in, he's basically been playing characters that are not allowed to emote or act. Oh, how bad! Right? Like in Blade Runner, he's like yeah, this flat affect, and and he's a very good actor, and he hasn't really had an opportunity to act recently. So he's pretty excited because Ryland is fairly emotive and animated and stuff, and he's looking forward to that. And and I said, yeah, I bet you're really sick of like these, you know, sad Ryan Reynolds looking out a window. <laughs> Whoops. And then I was like, I mean, Ryan Gosling. And he's like, yeah, don't worry. It happens all the I time. I do too. She's yeah, it happens he all the time. He seems time. like a really cool guy. And you know what? He's he, a really chill guy. He's perfect for that character because 
And it, I, no, again, no spoilers. But towards the end of the book, you there's a, a, a moment where you actually have this realization about this guy, and there's there's a, something in his character, a little character flaw. And I think mm -hmm. Ryan Gosling will be perfect. <laughs> oh, he'll nail it. I, I'm sure he's great. He's a great actor when they let him act. <laughs> you know, he was great in La La Land. There's no dancing. He was great in, this. in La La Land. I don't he, think that's a spoiler to say there. Well, there might be a little dancing. I don't think there's dancing unless they add it into the movie. <laughs> there's not really in the book. Eh, there's some, a decent amount of time in zero G. Do you call that dancing? Yeah, I don't there's know. some. Uh, there's some athletic movement. Yep. It's oh god, <laughs> just I I want to talk about it so much without, but I don't want to give anything away. We'll get to these things in the spoilers. Tell me section. about uh, tell me about the process of making this because it has been a while since Artemis. Well, I got this this big pile of buttons here, right? Yes. And if you hit these buttons, yes. letters show up. <laughs> and then if you do them in the right sequence, you get a book. Wait, wait, show me the keyboard again. Here it is. It's, <laughs> yeah, I know. This is my super professional, like $29 Logitech wired keyboard. Is the That's, whole thing written on that? Yeah. And, I know. And, and, I, I, so I'm not a gamer. Gamer, I mean, like video gamers are the guys who have the yeah, just absolutely fancy. magnificent yeah, Cherry stuff. MX switches and all that. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I just want a keyboard that's heavy enough that it won't bounce around when I'm typing on it. Although I do have a special mouse, this weird looking thing. Oh. You hold it, you hold it like this. Yeah. So here's the mouse. Yeah, I'm familiar and, with it. Yeah. And you, yeah, I, I think it's called a handshake mouse, whatever. Yeah. It's good for RSI, which I have. It's so the arc, arc mouse. So you use that because your wrist hurts, not your type, not from typing, but from mousing. But from mouse movement. Yeah. 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 Interesting. We, uh, if you didn't see the earlier uh, interviews uh, with Andy, he's a many years as a computer programmer. Uh, in, a, in an interesting variety of not just World of Warcraft, but also uh, management Sorry. MDM <laughs> modules for for businesses and a uh, whole bunch yep. of, whole bunch of different stuff. Uh, do you, yep. uh, did you get a cold? Uh, I'm allergic to like everything. Oh, so um, you know it's. But you have cats. Well, no, I can't. What I'm allergic to is several different kinds of pollen. Yeah, and so in the springtime, I'm just a horrible, mess. horrible. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so I'm sorry about that. I blame you. Did did uh, <laughs> it's my fault? Did it's your fault. Did quarantine help writing this? No. Um, well, so basically, I finished writing it before COVID struck. Uh, I, I finished the first draft back in January of 2019. So that was, uh, I mean, COVID was doing stuff, but it hadn't really escaped Wuhan yet. And uh, so. You, the, it was the editing process and the kind of refinement that you uh, you did all 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 in quarantine. See, well, I, I mean, just, uh, until March. So the the real lockdowns, the hardcore stuff, didn't happen until I was done with the book. Yeah, interesting. So I, I just imagine, boy, quarantine would be great for a writer. You'd think that, but it's not. <laughs> okay. Um, I thought it would be too. I thought like, okay, I'm done with Hail Mary. It's going to take a long time before it comes out because COVID shut down all the print production and all that stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, but whatever, I can start working on my next book. And, you know, I'll, I, yeah. you know, whatever. Lots I can of free time. Working. Yeah. And I got like nothing done. And I, I, I felt so crappy. I'm like, how did I do this? I just pissed away a year. How did that happen? And then I found out from um, other writers that I know and talk to, they all had the same problem. It's, uh, I think writers get a lot of inspiration and ideas and motivation from being out and about, like uh, just your interactions with the outside world. And being stuck in the house, you just, you have no new sensory input. It's just everything is something you've seen before. I don't know if that's what it is, but all the writers I know went through a similar slump. And they had the same surprise that I did. They they all said, like, I thought being stuck in my house would mean right. it'd be easier to motivate to write because I got nothing better to do. But no. You need, uh, you need grist. You need input. Uh, I think so. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, it's like I'll get ideas for characters based on like, you know, a store, you know, a, a grocery store clerk, you know, right? Or, or, or based on just some guy with funny clothes I see walking by on the street or whatever. You know, it's like this is where the ideas come from. And if all I'm looking at is stuff I've seen a million times before and various parts of my house, it's I'm getting no new sensory input, really. One of our chatters has renamed his uh, character Petrovoscope. 
Petrovoscope. No, very no, nice. No spoilers, but I'm just saying he <laughs> interesting. I think I think that individual has read the book. <laughs> One of the things that you're great in the book is uh, neologisms. Um and you've come up with a lot of fun names for various things that needed to be named in the book. Uh, yep. Yeah, are you good at that? No, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, well, coming up with names for things uh, is kind of fun. Coming up for names for name with names for characters is a pain. That's usually one of my stumbling blocks. Like I sit there and go, like, okay, I got to name this character. Uh, uh, Ted. <laughs> you know, I, I just like, <laughs> I'm terrible at it. <laughs> it's funny because uh, I, I always know when it's not a great book because you read the name and you go, well, that's made up. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> So, um, the but Elf King was so powerful and renowned that his first name alone had 20 apostrophes. <laughs> <laughs> but you do it so that the names just roll off and you go, yeah, that's their name. So yeah, I, I mean, you I may not be good at it, but you're good at it. Do you go to the phone book? I, I actually, what I'll do is I'll go on, I, I'll say like, okay, where's this person from? Like, what country are they from? Where are they from? And I say, like, what are the top hundred surnames in that country? Uh, what are the top hundred first yeah. names and stuff like that? You take a programmer's approach. Kind of, yeah, yeah. research and... So one of the th cool things about The Martian is it ended up being, and it, when we talked, it wasn't, wasn't yet, but I thought, gee, this would be a really good, I said for a uh, curriculum for a college physics course, it ended up being a curriculum for uh, high school physics, high school science. Mm -hmm. That must be so cool for you. It, must it is you cool. Good. It is cool. Yeah. yeah. There was enough demand that we have a, a, a classroom-friendly edition with the swear words dialed back a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, if anybody wants to use Project Hail Mary, they... No swear words. Just, yeah, there's... I think there's like two or three swear words in the entire book. <laughs> That's, a, you know, it's, uh, again, it's, it's, I wanna, <laughs> it could be a spoiler, but I'm not going to say it. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's not a huge spoiler. It's not a huge spoiler to say that Ryland doesn't swear. Doesn't like to swear. Doesn't like to swear. Nope. <laughs> uh, and there's a reason and you'll find out. Um, when we get to the spoiler section. When we get to the spoiler section. <laughs> But one of the things that if people who love The Martian will recognize immediately, and it's true in Artemis, but even more so in The Martian, is what you love to do for yourself is set yourself a, a, a thorny problem and then science the heck out of it, which I know you didn't the write heck. that line, but that's... I did not. No, yeah. but you but you do science the heck out of things. and uh, that's, that's true. And that line was in fact written by the illustrious Drew Goddard, who is currently working on the adaptation of Project Hail Mary. So, so expect another great line that Andy didn't write in the movie. That, that I get credit for. Right? Like, <laughs> that everybody everyone's says. Everyone's like, Andy, I love that line. Oh, it's the best part of the book. Oh, yeah. It's like the only good thing in the whole book is that one. Line. Well done. Oh, oh, the Not pain, the pain. <laughs> oh, the pain. I, I was, as I'm reading the book, there's a few things I'm thinking. One is, okay, I can't wait till he says full of grace. Never did. The other one, <laughs> but I knew you were thinking it. So oh, in yeah. a way, that was a great, that was oh, yeah. a great fun thing. Well, at least thing. like when I was naming him, I, like I said, I, I hate coming up with character names. I'm like, uh, Hail Mary, his last name will be Grace. Yeah. And his first name, I think I picked Ryland just because I wanted something a little off the beaten path. Yeah. Like, you know I want Jack something... Grace. Yeah, That's when right. I would say, yeah, this is a novel. Right. Um, I, I picked Ryland because I actually knew a guy named Ryland like 30 years ago. And I always thought, that's a very smart guy sounding name. I like that. And so. <laughs> yeah, you did it. You did it. And it's works. And uh, he is uh, a hero in the in a similar mold to Mark Watney, but not, which is kind of interesting. No, yeah. No, he's well. OK, so he's um, smart. Yeah. Um, so here's the, the uh, my my tale of of woe when it comes to characters. So I consider my biggest weakness as a writer to be characters. Like I can make pretty solid plots and I can keep the science accurate and I think I'm good at pacing, et cetera, et cetera. But um, my biggest weakness is characters. My characters are often kind of two dimensional. They lack depth. They don't have growth arcs, any stuff like that. Like Mark Watney is super shallow. Like. I mean, people like him, but nobody would call that character depth. All you know about Mark Watney after you've read the entire book, all you know is he's kind of smart, pretty funny, and he doesn't want to die. Yeah, That's it. That is literally all you know. Also, his personality doesn't change at all. He doesn't undergo any sort of growth or There's no. That's a good point. There's no character arc, is there? There's no character arc whatsoever. <laughs> I never thought of that. You know Nothing. what? I didn't miss it. 
Yeah, right. But because it, it was a heavily plot driven book. OK, so fine. Um, Science but, driven but, plot. Book. Yes. Yeah. But um, then then for Artemis, I thought like, oh, and also it should be noted for Mark, what I did was I just took the fav my, my favorite aspects of my own personality and made and magnified them. Interesting. So, yeah. I'm kind of smart. Mark's really smart. I'm yeah. kind of funny. Mark's really funny. And Mark has none of my flaws. And I have lots of them. But he doesn't have any of those. And so he's the idealized, distilled yeah. version of he's me. He's Matt Damon. He's Matt Damon. <laughs> then, comes, um, then comes Jazz Bashara and Artemis. And for her, a I woman. said, all right. Yeah. A, a woman. Yeah. You threw that yourself a big really challenge. To, yeah. No, nah, you know, so believe it or not, I mean, Jazz is just another aspect of me. Okay. Um, so what I did for Jazz was I was like, all right, I want more character depth, complexity, and a story arc and a growth. So for Jazz, she's 26 years old in the book. And so I said, I'm going to give her all the flaws I had when I was 26. Ah, I like it. Like basically she is a s theoretically smart, but still makes really bad life decisions. Right, right. She's kind of her own worst enemy. Most of her problems are self-inflicted. And so I gave her those flaws, the flaws that I had. So she's like, hey, take me, remove all the Mark Watney, and what's left is jazz. And <laughs> so the two of them least, together <laughs> make one. Make one me, weird. yeah. Or at least, I mean, hopefully I'm less of a screw up now, but uh, that's what I was, you know, kind of not not, not a super functional human being at 26. No, who so, is? Um, right. Yeah. Right. And, and so what I learned, and also Jazz realizes the error of her ways and stuff throughout the book and, and becomes a better person. So I'm like, there's there, much more got, of an arc for her, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I'm like, there, okay, we have depth, complexity, nuance, flaws, and a growth arc. Everyone's going to love it. Everyone hated it because <laughs> they had a really tough we time. We want Mark reading. Watney. <laughs> no, no, no. It wasn't that. Oh, okay. It, uh, I, I mean, it would be nice if I could just fall back on that, but no. Uh, it requires a little more introspection. I went too far with Jazz's flaws. She was too flawed. Oh, interesting. Um, it's it, you know, For a lot of people, it was just really hard to root for her because she was so much the agent of her own problems that... You know, people are like, oh, I want I want her to do well, but I also want to smack her. Just stop messing up your own life. So anyway. How do uh, you figure that out? Does somebody tell you that or? Well, lots and lots of reviews. I mean, I read and the, I mean, the professional reviews are, are okay, but actually the reader reviews, the yeah. just Amazon reviews and stuff like that. I can't read them all. There's They're like thousands, focus groups. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. And yeah. so you have to read between the lines because um, I want to know what the actual readers think, not just what some, you know, stuck up reviewer thinks. I, I want to know what they, what the real readers think, but there's thousands of them and uh, the readers aren't professional reviewers. So they, they don't always put into words correctly what it is that they had a problem with. So you have to kind of read mm -hmm. between the lines. A lot of, uh, like I got a lot of reviews. I got, I got really conflicting information from women, female uh, readers like about half of them said, I love jazz. She reminds me of me. She's so snarky and go get them. And yeah, nice, strong female character. And the other half of women uh, were, were like, oh, I hated jazz. She's clearly not a woman. She's clearly just a character, a, a woman written by a man, you know, and she, I don't buy her uh, as being female at all. And what I learned to do is I, I'm sure I still have a lot to learn about writing female characters. But what I really learned is that when they say she didn't seem realistic, what they're really saying is she is realistic and they don't like her. Like, yes, she's not she a hero. Like, she's not a hero. It's like, I, I think what it is, is she, she is realistic enough as a woman. It's just a woman you, I don't, I, you don't want to hang out with. <laughs> it's just, yeah. So I think anyway, if you hadn't written the Martian before Artemis, the reaction have, would have been yeah. very different. Maybe, maybe. Artemis on its own is a great book, but you oh, created... You an amazing hero with Mark Watney. And so I think the expectation maybe was, oh, now this is going to be another hero. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know. And also I, I do get annoyed at things say like, oh, this is just another male, uh, female masturbation fantasy written by a man. I'm like, no. Jess doesn't have sex at all. There's no sex. <laughs> she doesn't do that at all. Uh, look, She's I'm not a woman. really... So, she's never even in the mood. The I, whole book, she's got other. <laughs> Come on, guys. Yeah. No, and I'm, I, of course, I can't and any more than you can say, oh, whether it was well written woman or not. But I thought it was a very, very good book, and I really oh, hope you. that you will live that that the Moon Colony will live on because you've 
given yourself an environment. Yeah, it's my playground. I want to do stuff in it. But anyway, I was still droning on in answer to your previous question. Please which do. It, so I'm still trying to get better at characters, character depth. So the lesson I learned from Jazz was, okay, she had depth, complexity, nuance, flaws, and a character arc, but she wasn't likable. I drove the re I drove a lot of readers away with her unlikability. Yeah. And so then I said, like, okay, this time I'm going to try some some new stuff for Ryland. I decided number one, I'm going to stop just basing characters on myself. I'm I'm not going to make Ryland just be a reflection of me. I'm going to make him a character who is not based on me. I'm going to make him out of a whole cloth and I'm not going to be constrained by my own actual personality. And then number two, the flaws he has are not going to be things that drive the reader away from him. So, you know, Ryland's a little naive and he's kind of scared and stuff like that. And we've all felt this way. He feels overwhelmed a lot and we've all felt that way. And uh, so those are kind of the flaws that I tried to give him. There's some other flaws, but... They're kind of spoilers. And uh, yeah. And so I, it, and that was very difficult for me. I tried to make him like, I, it took me about five chapters of writing before his personality really started to gel. And then I went back and rewrote big chunks of the prior chapters so that it matched the personality that, that had come up. But yeah, and he has a growth arc and yada, yada, yada. He's so. a much more nuanced personality than Mark Watney. Sometimes I wonder, though, maybe all people really want you to do is write these superhero. You see so many superheroes in all uh, all fiction that <laughs> maybe that's people people need a hero, you know? I don't um, know. Um, he ends I, up a hero. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, oh, ending you. that but, that just everybody. Uh, by the way, you did that with a Martian, too. Mm. It, you know, this is one thing. A lot of authors are not good at endings. You're good I had at, the ending of this in mind. You're good at endings. Started. You're oh, good at you. endings. Oh, <laughs> man, are you good at endings. Well, oh. thank you. Well, that's important because it's really bad if you read a whole novel and you love it all the way to the end. And then you go, and I'm not going to name names, but there are some very well-known sci-fi authors who are notoriously bad at ending their books. <laughs> and uh, and it just kind of takes a little bit away from it. Yeah. You're good it at can. that. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate I'm it. I'm not saying it's a happy ending. <laughs> Please don't misunderstand. You know what? I'm done with this. All right. Spoiler time. <laughs> Put up the big auga. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Here we go. I encourage alert. those of you who have not yet read the book to stop now. And I am absolutely sincere in this. I don't say that for everything. There's a lot of things, you, you know. Well, frankly, when you go see a movie... Uh, it spoils the book if you haven't read the book. When you read the book, it's going to spoil the movie. So especially in a plot-driven stuff like Andy does. But in this case, I honestly want you to experience this fresh. I Don't even read the audible blurb. Don't I mean, just read it fresh. You don't want to know anything about this. That's how I came into it. And it really, the journey You went is, in blind? Yeah, and the journey yeah, is that's so fun. good. I think that's what I was hoping for. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're in post-spoiler. Post you can uh, go ahead and talk about whatever you like. <laughs> oh, no. I, I have, my tongue is tied. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I am so sincere in my desire not to spoil this for anybody. So stop. And if you're watching live, just go go take a walk. Read a book. Get get. There's a great book. You might want it called Project Hail Mary by Andy <laughs> Weir, published by Random House. It's available in bookstores. It's on Amazon. It's also an Audible book. If you have the choice and you like audiobooks, there is in the audiobook something that you can't get in the print. In fact, I haven't seen the print. How? So, spoilers. Okay. Spoiler. There's there. This is a first contact book, which I did not expect. Mm -hmm. Because in The Martian, it's really Watney alone. It's a it's a man in space all by himself. And I thought... Ryland's oh, in space, not all by himself. I thought, here we go again. Uh, we're going to go off in space all by ourselves to save the world in this case, which is nice. <coughs> and he has... He meets an alien, first contact. And in yep. fact, I have to commend you for this. It is the most plausible first contact I've ever experienced. The Thanks. idea, the aliens will come here. It's a long way. <laughs> Not easy. We're kind of in a backwater out here in the spiral arm of the galaxy. But this one makes sense. If you're going to run into an alien, that's ex you're going to run into an alien at Tau Ceti. And, <laughs> and I didn't think of it until it happened. And I went, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Basically, uh, 
Uh, for those of you who've decided, <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert. For those of you who've decided to continue listening and haven't read the book, shame on you. Shame on you. But basically, um, there is an extraterrestrial um, microbe, and this is all in the first chapter, but there's an extraterrestrial microbe that lives on the surface of stars. It's like algae in an ocean, but it's uh, it lives on the surface of stars. It's not intelligent. It's just a single-celled organism that breeds. And um, it can seed itself out to other stars. To do this, it sits on the star and collects enormous amounts of energy, which it stores as mass, and then it can uh, expend that as thrust. And it, all the physics works out on it. It's neat. It's a great right. mystery, too, because when they first discover it, they can't figure out what's going on. But they um, do know that our sun is dimming, and that will end all life on Earth if we don't find not a, a sun. good thing. A little early, not a, good thing. a little ahead yeah. of schedule, and then yeah, a little bit. And then so then they realize that out of all the stars in our local cluster, Tau Ceti, for some reason, is the only one that's not dimming. So they realize, okay, astrophage is what they name it. Astrophage again, great, for great eater. name. Yeah. yeah, star eater, right? Great Although name. technically, it's. To be fair, it's not eating the star. It's just living on it. Kind of like, you know, algae isn't any threat to the existence of the ocean, <laughs> but it lives there, right? Yeah. So It's a um, lot like algae, actually. Uh, it is pretty yeah. much just algae. Yeah. Um, and um, so We're not going to tell you spoilers about the end. So no, no, we won't, we won't go tell you end, what happens at the end. So, so in case you by hero, accident hear this. Yeah. Yeah. Our hero, uh, Rylan Grace, ends up on uh, a mission where they use this astrophage as fuel uh, to send a ship all the way to Tau Ceti. By the way, another really neat point. You had to invent the ion drive uh, for an earlier book. Well, I mean, it, for the you didn't Martian, invent it, but it, you had to upgrade. It, it. already existed. Yeah. <laughs> you have to upgrade it. <laughs> yeah. uh, you did you know this ahead of time that that's what astrophage was going to? Oh good? yeah, oh yeah. No, that was the, that was the core idea of everything. I was like, oh okay, and it, it, it worked out really well. It was like a shower epiphany. I'm like, ah okay, astrophage is the cause of the problem, and it's also kind of the solution yeah. to the problem. Yeah. Because it seeds itself to other stars. So it's able to store enormous amounts of energy and then use that to propel itself through space, which ultimately makes it like the perfect spacecraft fuel. Um, so that's that's um, that's that's how they they get to Tau Ceti while well, he's by himself. And then once he gets there, he encounters an alien spacecraft because their planet has the same problem. For the same reason. Yeah, for the same reason. Their planet is all, their star is also infected with astrophage. They also notice that all the local stars are getting dim except Tau Ceti, and then they go to Tau Ceti. In the fact, it's kind of amazing there's not a thousand other species at Tau Ceti. Well, it's... You gotta, you gotta get there. There's no faster than light travel in this book. You. <laughs> That's another, another really interesting yeah. thing. We're going. Oh, what a revelation! Sunlight. When he finally, he's looking at the sun. He's looking at the sun. And says, "There's something wrong here." Yeah. That's great. And he um, realized it. Yeah, he thought it. He thought he. He it assumed ain't the sun, that the baby. big sun he was looking at. <laughs> he assumed the big sun that he thought he could see was the sun. Then he realizes it's not our sun. You're and he's like, "Where the hell am I?" Traveler. Oh my god. Anyway, so the character, that's how we find the character of Rocky, who is also, he's the alien. Rocky is the nickname that Ryland gives him. And I think what you were um, happy about uh, in terms of plausibility is I, I, I wanted to do a first contact story my way, which is where I'm like, all right, there's no reason that an alien would be comfortable in our environment. There's no reason at all. So Rocky's native environment is like 210 degrees Celsius, 29 times our atmospheric pressure of pure ammonia. That's the air that he lives in. And <laughs> and so if he's in our atmosphere, he'll die almost immediately. And if we're in his, we'll die almost immediately. They're never, he builds tunnels and stuff like that so that they can talk to each other with a separation, but they're never. He's uh, a perfect compliment for Ryland Grace's skills. So Grace yeah, Rocky is, the is an engineer. Ryan yeah. is an engineer. So it's a, a, a Rocky's the engineer. So it's a perfect compliment. Well, the, the other thing I did that I've always wanted to do was I said like, why, why do we always assume that aliens we meet would be more advanced? Rocky's people are actually less advanced yeah. than we are. There's a few areas of technology that they're better I on. I love the things like that materials, they're- materials, technology. Their yeah. knowledge gaps 
are yeah. great. And the they way, didn't. Yeah. <laughs> the way Thanks. you ex, the way you do this is is beautiful, and um, it gave yeah. you a really nice All scope right. to make this kind of. I mean, again, I think this will be used in uh, in schools. Because you be, you, you learn in a really realistic way a lot of concepts, including Mendelian genetics. <laughs> <laughs> nicely <Mendelian>. done. <laughs> nicely done. Relativity. Okay. I mean, this it's just really good. In fact, when we talked a few years ago, you said you wanted a way to explain relativity. Yeah, and I still don't quite have that. I mean, I... It's a thing that happens in this book, but it's not critical to the plot. So uh, I, I note it. I because you skim it's, over it's, a little bit. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. so basically, um, it, um, it's Tell not City's, a plot point. Yeah, Tell said he's twelve light years away from of from our star, right. and um, so to get there. Um, you know, he's traveling on the Hail Mary, which uses astrophase for fuel. He gets going near light speed on the way there, and um, so. From Earth's point of view, it takes him about 13 years to get there. From the ship's point of view, from his point of view, it takes about four years because of time dilation. And he's unconscious the whole time anyway, so it doesn't really matter. It's not a big deal. One of the things you're really good at, and it, it, this is actually, uh, I think, a hard thing to do. A lot of sci-fi, it's strained. Uh, but you're, there's something about everything you happens in this book, and this is a perfect example. The first contact is it clicks into place, and it's just so. It's like, of course, uh, it's just so. It's, and I just want to praise you, oh, thank because you. you're there's something about it, and I and I and I think it looks effortless, but I bet you it's a lot of work. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah. I try to make everything like logical and rational, and I want to keep the plot moving along quickly. Um, one thing that helped a lot is like, I'm not, I, I try to avoid tropes. And among other things, these two, like Ryland and Rocky, basically trust each other right from the beginning. Um, because, and they become very good friends. And because they kind of have to. You know, Ryland at one point, he, you know, we see his thought process. He's like, you know, after he gets over the initial shock of meeting and uh, seeing an extraterrestrial ship, he's like, well, what do I do now? And he's like, I'm going to assume they're friendly. Because if they're not, I'm dead. I don't have like yeah. What choice do I have? Myself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have no way of defending myself. I'm, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to assume they're friendly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you they did are. some of the most interesting stuff, and I don't know. I think the uh, we we already have some people who are rereading it. <laughs> <laughs> they finished it because you because it is a page turner. So you read it and you go, well, I can't see. I can't wait till what's happening next. But then you want to go back a little bit and kind of relish it. And there's some really interesting philosophical questions that you raise. Uh, f thinking speed is, is a really good one. And I thought that that was fascinating. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, Rocky and Ryland, once they cobble together a language that enables them to speak, um, they um, at one point they start to speculate, how come we think at about the same rate? Like, how come you're not a thousand times smarter than me or vice versa? And they ultimately speculate and conclude that we think at a given speed, we, we think at a speed that evolution gave us. And the reason we evolved to think at a certain speed is to respond to things happening in our environment fast enough to survive. And things happen in your environment more or less based on gravity. Um, things, you know, in a lower gravity environment, things can't run as fast. In a higher gravity environment, they can run faster just because of contact with the ground and stuff. So since Ryland and Rocky, their two homeworlds are, well, ours is 1G, and we learned that Rocky's is a little over 2G's, which isn't a huge difference in the grand scheme of things. Because they came from similar gravities, they have similar rates of thought. Or that's the Isn't theory. that fascinating? You also yeah. talk about um, sound and light and there's some oh really yeah why do they why why so uh rocky uh is blind or rather he his species doesn't have the ability to see because they have such a thick atmosphere sunlight doesn't reach the surface their their biosphere is kind of like an ocean there's um photophilic life like floating in the upper atmosphere then there's life in a layer down eating that and so on so the food chain kind of moves vertically similar to an ocean and um 
So Rocky doesn't have eyes at all, but he has excellent hearing. He has like um, passive sonar kind of hearing. How hard was this book for you to write? Did this, you've done a few books now. Did this one yeah. come easily? Does it, was it difficult? At first it was very difficult because I wasn't sure. I mean, I made this book out of the junkyard of my mind. These were all different ideas. I mean, I had one idea for a mass conversion spaceship fuel, another idea for a character uh, who we didn't talk about at all, Ava Stratt. Um, oh, oh, love her. And yeah, by yeah, the way, the audio book, Ray Porter does her justice, I think. I don't know how you yeah, heard yeah. it in your head, but boy, it she was great in the audio. Yeah, she doesn't mess around. Um, and, and she was a character, I mean, she had a different name, but I, I took her from another story idea that I never developed. And then um, first contact story I always want to do. And also a guy waking up aboard a ship with amnesia. So these are all unrelated ideas that oh, I glued together. And it seems seamless, but there's a lot of spackle in the seams. Um, so it worked out well. But at first, when I was first writing it, I'm like, I don't know if this works. We'll see. But once I got Ryland's personality down, yeah. like I said, about five chapters in, then yeah. I'm like, okay, okay, I think this is working. And, and I knew the ending. And so I'm like, okay, I got I'm going to get to that ending and it'll be awesome. Is there, um, uh, forgive me for not knowing, but is there science in this that, that is impossible or made up or it some seems like most of it's pretty realistic. Um, yes. Uh, you have to go down to the subatomic level to find the BS, but it's there. <laughs> um, good place to hide it. Yeah. It's, it's well hidden. Basically, um, the, it, there's nothing in the book that is provably impossible, <laughs> but there are things in the book which are probably impossible. And one of them is um, a, a, a quantum effect that I made up called super cross-sectionality. And I, the, the cell membrane of astrophage has a, a feature that makes it impossible to quantum tunnel through. Yeah. So it's not possible for something to be on one side, then be on the other side right. without interacting with the membrane. Um, now, a neutrino can effortlessly pass through the entire planet Earth without touching anything. Like right now, you're having about 100 trillion neutrinos passing through you um, every second. But they're tiny, so they just... Whoop. Well, and they don't interact with it. I mean, it's right. they are famously hard to interact with. But an astrophage cell membrane can keep neutrinos inside. It stores them. And that's how it stores the energy that it gets. It, yeah, it, I thought the physics of astrophage must be kind of kind of tough to solve. Well, that there's problem. two there's there's two BSs in it. First off, the super cross sectionality of the cell membrane that allows astrophage to keep neutrinos, right? right? And second off, neutrinogenesis, which is um, the physics and math and everything works out. But what it is is um, two uh, hydrogen ions, basically protons, smack into each other. And the kinetic energy of that collision, instead of just being an elastic collision, the kinetic energy is becomes two neutrinos going opposite directions. So the energy and the momentum are conserved, and the you know the the energy is taken from the kinetic energy of the proton, so they'll slow down a bit. So that means that's why the critical temperature of astrophage is about 97 degrees, because if you have hydrogen gas at 97 degrees, they will be colliding with each other with the right kinetic energy to create two neutrinos. So that's all very, like the math all works out, but there's no reason to believe that would actually happen. <laughs> Well, that's not much suspension of disbelief. I don't, I don't, that's an easy Well, there is, to... there is something in real life called pair production, which is where um, you can have like, if you have like a heavy atomic nucleus, like a uranium atom or something like that, and a photon goes by, um, it can, it is possible and it happens. It'll be like a gamma ray or something, but it can go by and it can, that energy can become an electron and a positron um, going opposite directions, and then and the nucleus of that atom also gains a little bit of so, um, see, it, and so that balances mass and energy and everything like that. So it is possible for an energy to kind of randomly take other forms like that. So I just said, eh, here we have you know neutrinos get created under the right circumstances with this. So that's that's those are the physically highly questionable things. 
Also, Xenonite is... I love Xenonite, but... Xenonite is possible. The really? theoretical it, it is... Well, I mean, I don't know <laughs> what the molecules would be, but it is within the limits of the physically possible um, tensile strength. Interesting. Like, there's Interesting. a calculation. I don't understand all of it, but they said this... This value here is the maximum imaginable tensile strength. Like, it is not physically possible to make a material that has a higher tensile strength than this. And Xenonite's tensile strength is lower. Now, when you were writing The Martian and you were unknown, uh, you told me at the time that, you know, the Internet answered a lot of these questions for you. Can you now just, you know, call up, you know... <laughs> Richard Feynman and well, you can't call him, but well, I'm I I have a special phone <laughs> that lets me speak to the dead. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, cool. So mostly Einstein helped me out. <laughs> no, um, well, can you call Caltech and say, hey, I want to do this? How? Um, I can, but Google's faster. Yeah. Um, so most yeah. the vast majority of my research is uh, through Google. Though, fun story, as I just mentioned, I, I needed to learn a lot about neutrinos. Um, um, for this book for explaining how the astrophage works. And um, so I researched a bunch of stuff, but I couldn't find all of what I was looking for. And it just so happens that I know a guy named Dr. Charles Duba. Now, Chuck and I were high school friends. Oh my God. So this is before I was famous or anything like that. He was my lab partner in physics <laughs> and in high school physics. So Mr. Trimmingham's physics class. Nice, nice. <laughs> and I went on to be me and he went on to be Dr. Charles Duba, who was on a team that won the Nobel Prize uh -huh. for helping narrow down the mass of the neutrino. Well, there so you his go. His whole life is studying neutrinos. <laughs> So I gave him a call Chuck. and what do you know, Chuck was able to answer my questions about neutrinos. <laughs> That's That's so what a great story. And Mr. Trimmingham yes. is by the way, right now is smiling very broadly. Uh, perhaps, perhaps. Yeah. 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 That's pretty cool. You got one Nobel physicist and one uh, world famous science fiction author, and uh, the there same. There we go. Same science class. Pretty yeah, good. Yeah, we sat at the same little uh, uh, these awesome. days lab tables. You know, and did you for, study science? And you didn't. You were a computer science guy. Well, I mean, if if computer science counts, then yes. But other than that, no. not physics. Yeah, <laughs> just under. I mean, uh, lower division classes. Like, so was this she, something you discovered later in life, or did you always have this fascination? I was always interested in yeah. it. It's just um, when it came time to choose a career. I, I went with software engineering, and so that's what I focused on in my education. Right. And I didn't finish college either. I am a high school graduate. That's that's two of us. That's the extent of my uh, <laughs> education. <laughs> that's all you need these days. I guess in fact, so. I think you're better off. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, so many, John. Uh, so one question, apparently, Captain Jay was going to ask you. Uh, he asked a question about Jazz's toy in Artemis, and you responded via email. I doubt you could still respond to people via email. Do you answer? Sure, that? I do. You do? Yeah. Yeah, I respond to all fan mails. I'm not such a big shot that I get more email than I can respond to. Yeah, I, I, you just keep up with it. I spend maybe 15 or 20 minutes oh, a day nice. responding to fan mail. Yeah, that's I mean, nice. writers, writers aren't like actors who have like millions and millions of fans thinking about them all the time. Not that many people go out of their way to email a writer. So not 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 like a huge percentage of your readers will contact you. Yeah. So it's not I still answer all fan mail. That's that's really cool. We are by the way not flashing your email address on the screen at this moment. <laughs> right? Well, you can find my email address very easily just google around. I, think I don't that's have how we that's how we got a hold of you, I think. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Um I, I mean I post it on my website and stuff. Yeah. And um I don't have a secret email address. That's just yeah. that's my email address. Uh do you, do you keep your website up? Because that's where The Martian was first published. Uh, yeah, I mean, The Martian isn't there anymore. Yeah. But um, I do, I, I mean, I haven't updated it in forever, but I left it up there because I've got various short stories up yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Do you still write short stories? Not very often. I mean, I do sometimes because someone will want a story for a collection. Like I recently wrote a short story called Randomize for a... Um, a short story collection called Forward. Yeah. So it's it's short stories by many different authors. Right. So I wrote one, Veronica Roth wrote one, Blake Crouch wrote one in there, I think. Nice. What's yeah, and the the name of the collection is called Forward. Forward. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. And so, my yeah, and my story in it is called Randomize. I will so that's like it. one yeah. example, but I don't often write a lot of short stories now. Have you started work on the next? 
I have, but I'm not really talking about it because no. I'm not convinced that this will be the one that I run with. Yeah. Um, you know, I learned from Jack that story that I got, I spent a year on and got 70,000 words into, uh, for reference, the Martians, a hundred thousand words. And I, I was a year and 70,000 words into Jack when I realized that it sucked and it was unsalvageable. And, um, so I don't really announce what I'm working on until I'm really yeah. sure that this is, it's going to work. Sensible. My mother always told me, if you think somebody's a great baker, it's just because you haven't seen all the cakes left out in the rain. They're not, yeah. yeah. You only deliver the good stuff. So, but you did so, say- Oh, your mom was the one who baked that MacArthur Park <laughs> cake? MacArthur's Park cake. She now left you that know. one out in the no. rain. <laughs> oh, all this, it was so sad. All the sweet you, green icing melting good. down. You got that reference. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, and she'll never have that recipe never, again. She'll never have that recipe again. <laughs> Did you, um, you said parts of Jack got into uh, Project Hail Mary. What, yeah. what particular parts? There were two things in Jack that were good and the rest of it. So it's like sorting through a big pile of manure and there's a couple of diamonds in there. Um, one of them was in Jack, there was an alien technology called black matter that was functionally the same as astrophage. Uh, black matter wasn't a life form. It was a technology. Right. It would absorb any electromagnetic waves and turn it into more black matter via E equals MC squared. And I didn't bother explaining anything deeper going on. Like I didn't bother to explain what's going on inside of black matter or how that works. Um, and that was like kind of the seed of Hail Mary. I was like, boy, it'd be cool. Just ignore all the other stuff and check. Just black matter would be neat. We yeah. could colonize Mars. We could, I mean, it'd yeah. be amazing. And then I'm like, but we, we can't invent that. I can't write a story where someone invents that. It doesn't make any sense. It's just way too advanced. I could have it be alien technology that someone finds, but then where are the aliens? Like why, what, you know, that I don't, I don't like that. And then I said, well, it takes energy and makes more of itself. That sounds kind of like life. So what if it's just a single celled alien microbe. And then I'm like, okay, so why does it have so much energy and why can it do all this stuff? Oh, okay. It's interstellar. It travels from star to star and it even lives on the surface of stars. That's how it gets all its energy. I'm like, okay, so we find some of that and we start farming it and we make a Mars base and a Venus base. And I'm like, oh, of course we'd have to be really careful to make sure none of that got into our sun. That'd be a disaster. <gasps> Oh, that's the book. Forget all that other crap. <laughs> you, know? you must and take then, really long showers. Okay. <laughs> well, I take one every day. So how's that? There you um, go. But, but, and then the other thing I saw, like I said, there was a character in Jack who was basically Strat. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. although more magnified, <laughs> the character in Jack was actually literally a psychopath. And Strat is not. No. Strat is She's a, good, a no nonsense. Good guy. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. She uh, actually, you, she has a nice character arc, actually. There's a lovely moment with her. Yeah. She feels kind of bad. I mean, her, she's been tasked with saving the world, literally. She's in charge of Project Hail Mary, and she has unrivaled authority. No, no human being in history has been as powerful as Ava Strat. And she uses this solely for good. But she's like, her her objective is clear. If she fails in what she's doing, all humanity will die. So she doesn't have a lot of time for, for BS or <laughs> bureaucracy or anything like that. And she doesn't have any patience for it. And she would, uh, you know, happily throw a bunch of kittens into a furnace if it increased the odds of it surviving, of, 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 the, of humanity surviving. And she'd sleep well that night. But uh, she does feel a little bad for some of the things that she has to do. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. we sh which we, we shall not name. Um, yeah. But there's quite a bit of it. Uh, uh, she, yeah, but she doesn't mess she's around. Badass. She, yeah. <laughs> she's a character. She's a character that you kind of. I think everybody fantasizes about being that person. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice yeah. if? If Nothing you could stood just, in my way. Yeah. 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 Wouldn't it be nice if you if you really could fight City Hall? Yeah. Like if you could just be like, oh, that looks like bureaucratic nonsense. We're not doing it. We're doing this instead. Yeah, I know those are your procedures, but these are my procedures. And so we're doing it this way. Well, honestly, <laughs> uh, you know, you have a middle school science teacher who's traveling to another star to save the world, meets a spider-like alien. And the thing I found least believable in the whole story is that everybody got together in the world to save the world <laughs> well i mean they didn't have much choice and yeah but i you know what uh i'm reading this i'm thinking now if we could just fix the climate well the climate isn't an instant existential threat True. right 
Like the climate is something that a lot of people say like, okay, we could fix the climate if we were willing to set our technology back to the stone age and just stop using fossil fuels. Or we could adapt to the new climate, which is caused by us using fossil fuels. And a lot of people would quietly rather say, you know what, if the three anus mud sloth goes extinct and the ocean goes up by a meter and that's all it costs us, I'm cool with it. Nobody wants to admit that in, in real life, but you know, but here we're talking about literal extinction, like within one generation. It is a climate change crisis, though. It, was it, that it is one of the reasons not, you wrote this? I mean, no, 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 there's never any subtext or moral or hidden meaning. And in fact, in the book, the damage we've done to the environment turned out to be good. Yeah. Um, in fact, because yes. it kind of bought us we a little more time. We could use some more methane right now. Yeah, right. Yeah. They, it bought us a little bit more time to react because we had these greenhouse gases that helped earth retain the energy it was getting from the sun. So if you, if you, (laughs) if you read, if you read morals into my book, then you will say like, I guess Andy's saying climate change is good. When astrophage gets here, we'll be ready. I'm just saying we'll be ready. We'll be ready. So trust me. No, there is no, there's no, climate message in there I, there I, is I, one very sad climate scientist who's <laughs> tasked with the job of like <laughs> massively destroying increasing the earth house. basically to but save it saving the yeah. earth <laughs> yeah 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 it's um uh I, and it's not a knock to say that it's it's uh incredible it's just that it, in the last year we've been through it's kind of hard to imagine all the countries of the world getting see, together and agreeing you on see anything. i disagree because i i gotta disagree 100 percent because this is the thing the that we do the it. World, no, the countries of the world did get together and agree on things. Like we all, pretty much every country on earth did a lockdown. That's and true. And we were all working on, That's true. on ways of treating it. We were all sharing information on how to, you know, what's the best way to try to minimize the spread of COVID. And now that we're starting to get ahead of it, the countries that have excess vaccines are just like the United States is just sending it out to... Yeah. Everyone they can, everyone they can send it, every, they, we, everyone we can send it to. It's like, okay, we've got another 60 million doses. Let's send that to India. They, they're having troubles. Let's help them out. So I think, I think that COVID has shown a lot of the best of humanity. I like that. I like and that. also I have my bold prediction. I believe COVID-19 will be the last pandemic in human history. We might have learned a lesson. Well, n- not so much learned a lesson. It's just that we people don't understand the sheer magnitude of what the scientific community did in response That's right. to COVID-19. We didn't just come up with a new vaccine to deal with the problem. We came up with a new technology that now allows us to make a vaccine for a virus within like two or three weeks of identifying the virus. That's absurd. Normally it would take years to come up with a vaccine for a new virus. And now thanks to mRNA technology, the next virus that causes a problem, we'll have a vaccine ready in like three weeks. Then we got to mass produce it and distribute it. But we actually showed that we were already pretty good at the mass production and distribution part. Like we science the crap out of it. That's we what we science did. the crap out of it. And, <laughs> and so the next major pandemic that happens, we're going to have that technology. And also if the pandemic happens within the next 30 or 40 years, it'll be in living memory how to live with a pandemic and people will be like, okay, I remember this, this sucks, but we know what to do. Yeah. And if it happens after that, after it falls out of living memory, kind of like there's no one alive from the Spanish flu. So we had to relearn what to do right. during a pandemic. Right. If it's like a hundred years in the future, I honestly believe medical technology will have just, oh, new virus, here's the cure. I love it. So that's my prediction. COVID-19 is the final pandemic. I think you might be right. Yeah. There we go. Good job, call everybody. Me, call me a Pollyanna. Good job. You're an optimist. Let's just say I am. that. Yeah. I like humanity. I think we do a pretty damn good job. We don't really have any oversight, yet we always seem to make the world Somehow. better. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, tell me, you know, pick a year in history and then tell me whether you'd rather live in that year or the one 100 years prior to it. Yeah. No, that's true. You're almost true. always going to pick the latter year. Yeah. 2020 sucked but I'd rather live through 2020 again than 1920. I don't know about you, but none of my friends have died of typhoid fever and no. I have never, ever seen a no colored sign in a store window. We're making a little progress. In my whole life. We're not perfect, <laughs> but we are making progress. Yep. And and Andy, you are an optimist. You know, I am. 
They say a we pessimist. We always do the right thing. Winston Churchill said it about Americans, but I think it could be extended to all of humanity. We always do the right thing after we've exhausted every other option. Yes, that's right. We try. <laughs> we try to screw it up, <laughs> but we end up doing the right thing. They say a pessimist is somebody who says the glass is half full. The optimist says the glass other is... Other way around. Half empty. The optimist says the glass is half full, but the engineer says the glass is poorly designed. And I think that that's... <laughs> <laughs> the most important the engineer lesson. keeps half of his water in a redundant glass. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Weir, you are. Uh, That's from Dilbert, by the way. Uh, credit where credit's Credit where, give it to Scott. Uh, yeah. You are a, a, a gem. We hope oh, you thanks. will write many, many, many more of I your plan great to. novels. <laughs> I love it that you now, you're now officially, you know, full time novelist. Um, it's great. And you don't miss coding at all? Do you do any little coding? On I the do side? miss coding. I yeah. really do. Uh, um, I, I, I miss not just the actual coding, but I, I actually really enjoy writing software. It was a good career for me. I mean, if I wasn't a writer, I would still be a pretty happy guy. It's fun. I love coding. Um, it's the yeah. same thing. It's solving problems. Yeah. Um, I loved coding. And I also specifically, I enjoyed the environment of my workplace. I, I liked being part of a team of engineers working on an app. And, you know, sometimes we have to go into crunch mode and that's all of us together. It's almost like being war buddies, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. I miss that environment. And I, I'm a writer. I sit in my office by myself. I write. But um, to answer your question, yes, I have done a little bit of coding. Um, I'm, I'm not sponsored or anything, but there's an app called Tabletop Simulator, which lets you play board games remotely oh um and neat. so my my friends and i play board game during the whole pandemic we did remote board gaming what games were and, you playing oh i mean lots of stuff uh but um lots of different board games but so you can write mods for tabletop simulator that are you know the board games you want to play so there are a bunch of board games that we like to play that nobody'd written mods for so i wrote a bunch of mods nice. I wrote a mod for a game called Team Play. I wrote one for Ticket to Ride. I wrote one Love for to ride. Power Grid. Fun. I wrote, yeah, I, I wrote a whole bunch of mods for my friends and I, and that's that fun. What it's language fun. do you write though? Is that Lua or? I, it's in Lua. It yeah. is. It is in yeah. Lua. And I'd never written in Lua before, but it was turned out to be so similar Lua's to JavaScript. Great. I didn't yeah. have a problem. Yeah, yeah. Lua's great. It's a, yeah. it's a perfect for that kind of thing. <clears throat> yep. Andy, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you for th Thanks three for great me. books. And Project Hail Mary is fantastic. Everybody has to read it. It's <laughs> every moment you go is a revelation. That's what I love about it. Is it's just every moment. I want to keep you up at night. I don't want you, you to do. put the book down. You go. You yeah, stay up all night. Yeah, yeah. It's you sleep on your own time. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody must get Project Hail Mary. It's on Audible. It's uh, from Random House. You can get it uh, everywhere, every bookstore. Probably they have a, a display of hundreds of them. Are you, do, you, do you? I guess you won't go on a book tour because of no. Uh, COVID. Um, you're looking at my book tour. This yeah. is what I've been doing my whole book tour. And at first I thought, oh, this is cool. I can't leave the house. They don't. They're not going to pack me full of travel and work me to the death like they usually do. But this time they said, oh, he doesn't have to travel. We can schedule like five oh, events crap. a day. I they're know. all just like boom, boom, boom. I'm sorry. Well, I'll let you go. You're probably exhausted. I do have to uh, ask you one thing. This whole time I've pleasure. been watching over your left shoulder, there's a, a stuffed oh. animal. <laughs> That's a that's a that's a dog toy. Okay, I just thought. Uh, and there's, there's oh, there's the fact, bed. We didn't see the bed, or I would have known. Yep. You see? Yeah. Yeah. There, that's a dog that's, bed. And a Andy's dog a master of the reveal. Yes, there we are. <laughs> there you are. Now you know the deep dark secret. <laughs> I have a dog. I also have two cats. And, and two the cats. Edge and the side, my side uh, out the window here of my office is a catio that I built. Oh, I, we've been thinking about doing that. That's a great idea. I really like it. Oh, that it's idea. great. They love yeah. it. They go out there all the time yeah. and they won't. I live in sort of a, a kind of a little bit out of the way, kind of right up against the um, the hills. And there we get so coyotes pretty. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so you so, don't want like, them out and wandering. Yeah. I don't, I don't want yeah. the cats out on their own. Yeah. yeah. My friend's cat just got uh, injured by a badger. Of all things, I said I thought badgers were from the English countryside. He said, "No, no, we have them in California, and they're protected. You can't go out and kill a badger." Well, I mean, there goes my weekend plans. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Weir, thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, congratulations for on uh, your marriage and uh, oh, a yep, brand new too. book. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, we really uh, can't wait to talk to you again. Thank you. All Andy. right, thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Well, that's it for our interview with Andy Weir. I uh, I hope I didn't spoil anything for you. I hope we didn't. 
if if you you know i know me i would have watched the whole thing and gone oh and spoilers so i'm sorry i apologize but do still read project hail mary it's fantastic uh this is the first of our twit events since we launched club twit uh and the first triangulation in some time uh, so I really want to thank our members uh, at Club Twit for making this possible. You hear that all the time, you know, uh, triangulation is made possible by listeners like you. Well, in this case, it really is. If you're not yet a member of Club Twit, I, uh, I'd, I'd appreciate it if you join seven bucks a month. Look, I know times are tight and that's a lot of money, but what do you get? You get ad-free versions of all of our shows. You get our great Discord channel, which is a rep server. It's many, many channels on it. It's really a lot of fun. You get to participate in shows that we do only on Discord, like the Untitled Linux show and our Inside Twit shows. Uh, you also get a special Twit Plus feed of stuff that uh, didn't make it out into any of the podcasts, unique stuff. There's more and more going to be appearing there. And you get the satisfaction of knowing that it's thanks to your support we could do things like this that are not advertiser supported. So if you're interested, man, it, it really we really appreciate it. The response has been fantastic. Just go to twit.tv slash club twit. That's it for this twit event and this special triangulation. I'm Leo Laporte. Thanks for joining me.